Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. I'm going to be doing some repairs on this Oberheim 4 voice synthesizer, and I thought I'd make a repair video on it. But first, I want to provide some better context for the repair work that's to come. So in this video, we'll look at the inside of the 4 voice, see the different modules that make it up, and discuss how they work together to make an amazing synthesizer. This synthesizer is the predecessor of the OBX, and the evolution of the Oberheim synthesizers is really fascinating. Tom Oberheim started by making what he called the SEM, Synthesizer Expander Module. Each SEM is a complete synthesizer with two oscillators, two envelope generators, a VCF, a VCA, and an LFO. The 4Voice has four individual SEM modules here screwed into the panel. Individual SEMs could be bought in a little enclosure with a power supply and some interface jacks. Back in my video, Synth Chaser 139, we repaired one of the modern reissue standalone SEMs. They also came as just modules, and you could integrate them into your system by wiring up connections to the various Molex connectors on the circuit board for CV, gate, and the like. My friend Don Lewis did this with his LEO, Live Electronic Orchestra Synthesizer. Oberheim eventually pre-wired them into the two, four, and eight voice synthesizer systems. There are some other modules wired up here as well to get these four SEMs to function as a cohesive system. First, down here we have the keyboard electronics module. This module scans the keyboard and outputs four keyboard control voltages and four gates, plus a control voltage for the filter. On the surface, this seems like a simple task, but once you start looking at all the different options for voice assignment, and consider that this module is built entirely of CMOS and op amps, there's no microprocessor, no DAC chip. It seems like a pretty impressive module considering its mundane task. In fact, it was so novel at the time that it was patented. It's a little fiddly to get in here to show you, but the keyboard switch matrix comes in here on this connector, and the four sets of keyboard control voltages and gate signals come off these two circuit boards below. Next to the keyboard electronics module, we have the programmer. Even on a monosynth, one can see the value in being able to save and retrieve patches at the push of a button, without having to adjust all the different knobs to where they need to be. Well, imagine how cumbersome it would be to have to do that on each SEM every time you wanted to change the patch. And you can forget about adjusting anything as a performance control without some way to control all of the SEMs from one place. So in a nutshell, the programmer allows you to control all or some of the SEMs from a set of master controls. It provides a way to save presets with a battery backup and retrieve them quickly at the push of a button. Regrettably, not all the controls that are physically on the SEMs made it here to the programmer. So some important parameters like pulse width and resonance still need to be tweaked in four different places. One really cool thing about the programmer is that for a given preset number, you can actually save different patches for each of the SEMs. You can also decide individually which SEMs will be using the preset from memory and which SEMs will be in manual mode, being controlled live by the knobs on the programmer. Just like the keyboard electronics board, the programmer is all built without a microprocessor and the result is a big stack of circuit boards sandwiched together under the panel, loaded with CMOS and op amps. A fascinating feat of engineering at the time, but something difficult to understand and repair today. Like the keyboard electronics board, this was so novel at the time that it was also patented. Shortly after the release of this, Dave Smith, may he rest in peace, came along with his Prophet 5 and pioneered the use of a microprocessor for controlling polyphonic synthesizers. So most of the polysynths out there are based on that approach. This thick stack of circuit boards may look intimidating, but each layer has a pretty well-defined job. The very bottom down here holds all the pots and switches. This next layer is what they call the, the overhead logic layer. It generates the clock and control lines for the other board's memory operations. It scans the pots, performing analog to digital conversion on their values, serializes that data, and sends it to the other boards, either to be used for writing to a preset memory or converting back to control voltages to drive the SEMs in manual mode. The next two boards are called the channel boards, and they each drive two SEMs. This one drives SEM 1 and 2, and this one drives 3 and 4. If this were an 8 voice, there would be two more of these boards on the stack. 
These boards receive in a keyboard control voltage from the keyboard electronics module, as well as the clock, control signals, and data stream from the programmer's overhead logic board through the board-to-board -board connectors. In preset mode, it reads from the memory chip, and in manual mode, it uses the data stream from the overhead logic board, and it performs digital-to-analog conversion to generate the control voltages to drive the SEMs. There's a little more to it, and we'll look at this closer in the next video when we make some repairs to the programmer. For those of you familiar with the Oberheim OB-1, the OB-1 uses the same technique for its programmer. Finally, here in the upper left, we have the output module, which lets you mix the volume and panning of each SEM. For those of you familiar with these series, you'll recall that the Oberheim 2 voice synthesizer, like mine here, has a mini sequencer module. The mini sequencer was a simple eight-step sequencer. Well, for the four and eight voice synthesizers, a mini sequencer just won't cut it. So with these synthesizers, you can use the Oberheim DS2 digital sequencer, like mine here. The DS2 sequencer was one of Oberheim's first products, and I believe the first product branded with the Oberheim name. It's huge in size, but not in memory. It's only got a 72 note capacity. But like the four voice control modules, like keyboard electronics module and the programmer, it was built without a microprocessor, and it's really a fascinating piece of technology. Maybe I'll do a video on this sequencer sometime, but for now we'll focus on fixing the four voice. So now that we've had a high level look at what makes the four voice work, in the next video I'll show you some of the problems the customer is having with this synth, and we'll repair them. So if you're not subscribed already, now would be a good time to do it, so you don't miss the next video. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.